Perfect. Now I have your number. Thanks. Hey, I'm Robbie Kramer. You're listening to the Leverage Podcast, where we discuss using your social skills to hack dating, travel, finding your dream job, and becoming a complete man. Welcome back, everyone. Our guest today is Brandon Webb, a combat decorated Navy SEAL sniper turned entrepreneur and author who has built two brands into eight figure businesses. As a U.S. Navy chief, he was head instructor at the Navy SEAL Sniper School, which produced some of America's most legendary snipers, including Chris Kyle, the hero portrayed in the hit Hollywood movie American Sniper. And uh, from what I've gathered, Brandon speaks a lot on his Instagram channel about overcoming fear. And it seems like he spends a lot of the time flying his plane upside down over Manhattan when he's not doing that. Uh, We have a mutual friend in Ukraine who twisted his arm to come on the podcast. Really happy to have you here, Brandon. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. So I Googled the fuck out of you before this interview. Uh, (laughs) Mostly good stuff. (laughs) Hope all that was accurate. Uh, Yeah, no, it was good. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I did, I watched a bunch of Navy SEAL movies. Um, and uh, I have been saw some of your interviews. It seems like in terms of like how accurately Hollywood portrays the SEALs and BUDS and Hell Week, um, from what I've seen from you, you said they get that right some of the time. They miss some of the, you know, the accuracies about like, you know, the scope on people's rifle not being, you know, in the shot or whatever. But you think Hollywood does a decent job? No. No? Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, would say, I would say they do a good job entertaining people. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't do a good job on the technical aspects. I, I ripped into American Sniper. And look, I'm sometimes at the detriment to myself, um, a very honest person. Uh, I went and saw American Sniper because we reviewed it for, for my uh, – my media company at softrep.com. Um, we get these early screenings and I sat down in New York and my, they wanted a review, right? They're like, Hey, go watch this. And hope, hopefully Brandon writes a review on the movie. Um, I think they automatically thought I would just give this glowing review because Chris was a friend and, uh, you know, and, and a student at the sniper program. And I saw the movie and my, I was like, Oh my God, this is so bad from, like they're showing sniper instructors yelling at students like they're in boot camp. And I'm like, we don't do that. That's so unprofessional. Um, and then the, the weapons and everything. And my, my litmus test was what would Chris, if he were alive sitting next to me, be happy with the military technical side of the, the movie. And he would have lost his fucking mind. Really? And that's why I, I ripped it apart on my review and it's like, people are like hating on me. Like, Oh, you, what do you know? You know, they just, you know, you know, you're like, I was the head instructor at the sniper (laughs) studio. The studio is upset. Now they won't, they won't no more invites coming my way. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm like, fuck, you wanted it straight. I gave it to you. And then I had time. I, I did follow it up with a review. And this is what I was getting about with Hollywood does you know, do a good job on the entertainment side. What I did appreciate about the movie American Sniper was it, and I thought Clint Eastwood did a good job, is they showed the toll of what happens to the families back home, right? I think showing, like portraying what happened to Chris's wife and the family, and it's very hard on these families. And it's very um, complicated because sometimes the, and this is very well known in, in the case of Chris Kyle, the the immediate family, his mom and dad, brother are at odds with his his wife, uh, with the widow, um, Taya. Um, and that causes a lot of family drama. And it's like, you've got to choose sides, right? And I just try and like stay out of all that stuff. Um, but generally, um, the most accurate, I would say, Navy SEAL movie I saw was Act of Valor and they use real SEALs in that movie. They're not actors, obviously you can can tell that um, in the, in that movie, but very technically accurate that, that movie. And then as far as like depicting training, Buds 234, which is a discovery channel show. um, 
uh, like followed a class 234 around and, and that, and I, that is a very, I mean, it's just pretty much, you know, aside from missing out on some of the, maybe the barracks banter and, and stuff that goes on behind the scenes was a pretty good portrayal of, of how tough that training is. And, um, and look, I, even Dan Bilzerian, which everybody knows now, um, Dan went through Navy SEAL training twice and didn't make it through. Like, and yeah. I, I don't know the full story. I've heard he got, we do this thing called a peer. Uh, you can peer people out where the instructors go at the end of the class, like at the end of this like grueling program, and they say, who did we miss? Like, who's lurking here that shouldn't be in the teams? And then you write down a name on a list and you like slide it in anonymously. Okay. Um, Is that 27 heard, weeks? That Yeah, about seven months. Okay, yeah. And, that, and look, that's not seven months and you're a trained Navy SEAL. That's just to get through the door so you can start training, start doing like the real training. Uh, and with, your sniper school came after that, right? Yeah, so... Um, anyway, my, my point is the, um, it, it's an incredibly tough program. Um, and it's funny cause Dan and I got into this big thing about, cause he was on the movie Lone Survivor. Right. And, uh, he, he bought his way into that movie. Yeah. I saw he had the one line. <laughs> it was a huge controversial thing because, um, my friend Marcus didn't want him on the set when he found out who he was. And Marcus was like, you're a buds quitter you know, you're a seal quitter, Dan. And Dan's not like to his credit, he didn't quit, but he got, he got booted out for, for some reason. I, I don't know. The, Someone wrote down something. I, don't know. I heard that he got peered out, mm -hmm. uh, which, or, or the instructors just didn't like him. So um, whatever reason, uh, yeah. that, that's what happened. But when you go through that, um, you go to a three month, uh, tactical training program you get assigned to a seal team and then it's another year or a year and a half of of tra additional training with your seal platoon and some specialized personal training for yourself like i went to sniper school um, i went to to uh learn how to repair the drager rebreather system i went to the factory and took a factory course because i was with the diving support guy um, and i also went to an army parachute rigger school to learn how to, re to sew pack uh, and repair larger parachute systems. So I would maintain the, the platoons parachutes when we go overseas. So a, a lot of additional training that happens after that. And, and then you deploy. And once you got a deployment under your belt, you're kind of like considered a member of this community. Um, so it's a long time. That's insane. So that was what for you? So it sounds like two or three years prior to deployment. And then yeah. how long was your tour? You did a couple of tours, right? Yeah, I, I did a tour in, in uh, the Middle East. It was on, uh, we were doing uh, ship boardings uh, back when we were doing the UN sanction, enforcing the UN sanctions against Saddam Hussein in Iraq, who was smuggling oil out of, out of the country um, against the sanctions. Uh, it was a massive you know, profitable business for the smugglers. Um, and we would board those ships at night, take them over, sometimes cut our way, have to cut our way inside because uh, they would weld themselves inside the ship. Um, so I, we were doing that. Our, my first deployment was SEAL Team 3. Uh, then the USS Cole got bombed in Yemen uh, by two terrorists in a, in a small boat, almost sank, you know, a billion dollar warship in the harbor. Um, set up, we've, um, went down to the coal, set up a perimeter, a security perimeter with a special boat team. Uh, and, uh, and I, I had, uh, it was me and, and a few snipers set up a, a spot on the ship to kind of, uh, keep people at bay. Cause the government, U S government was worried the ship was going to sink. Like any, if they, somebody farted towards the coal, that ship would have sank in the Harbor. <laughs> so, wow. Um, crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. Then I came back. And we had a problem platoon, like, you know, we don't always get it right. This, this platoon at the team, everybody knew about it called Echo Platoon. Um, totally dysfunctional, not working. Uh, it's like in business, right? When you hire the wrong people, some, sometimes the people are good people, 
they're just not chemi- – there's no chemistry in that team. You see it a lot in sports too, right, where you have these superstars that don't get along. Um, you know, everybody has to kind of realize they have a role to play. They disbanded this platoon, and I got asked by Kevin, our ops officer, hey, would you go into this platoon and kind of help rebuild? So I, I jumped into Echo Platoon, which I didn't want to do necessarily because it had such a bad reputation, and I had – been in a really, really good platoon uh, as a new guy and, but jumped into Echo um, and Echo was actually supposed to deploy uh, relatively quickly. I think they failed their operational readiness exam. So you train as a platoon, like 16, 18 guys at the end of that year or year and a half training cycle, you take a an operational mission readiness test. And if you fail, it's a big deal. And I believe that they had failed and, and then they just broke it up and, and reformed it. Um, and they were next out the door. So then I jumped in there, was was being one of the guys with experience to kind of rebuild that team. They put more, more new people in there. We had a lot of really good new guys uh, that just didn't have good mentorship. So I, I was doing that and then 9-11 happened and I found myself deployed overseas with this kind of like misfit platoon, um, which I took a lot of shit from these guys. <laughs> but again, it's like, I'm honest about it, right? And, and like guys don't like to be, even in my first book, The Red Circle, you know, it's funny because you you don't realize people say, oh yeah, you can tell that story. And then the book did really well. And all of a sudden this person that gives you permission to tell this story, they become famous for something they didn't want to be famous for. Like uh, one of the guys in the book quit, he literally quit SEAL training and just kind of like escaped accidentally. Um, and, and, uh, and he became like, Oh, you're the guy that quit in Brandon's book. And that's like, you know, it drove him nuts probably. So right. Um, you just don't realize what, you know, <laughs> if I had to rewrite the book, I would have changed everyone's name and still told an honest story. But um, yeah, I saw one interview um, where the reporter kind of asked you, he, he mentioned like some people were like saying like you broke the SEAL code or some bullshit like that about writing about it. And your response was like, well, when you're in the SEALs, of course, you're not going to do that. But, you know, after like people are going to write, people are going to, you know, speak up about it and. Yeah, that's, look, I've never, there's, there are certain groups that I worked with outside of the SEAL teams that I just don't talk about. Like I've signed those non-disclosure papers and I know I can't talk about it. I, I trust me, I've asked formally to like finally years later, talk about it and write about those experiences. And they said, no. So I'm, I'm like, okay, I can't do that. But, you know, to talk about my SEAL experience, I don't have any problem with that. And, and, and a lot of it's been super therapeutic. And, and a lot of these guys that, and I was an early, like Marcus Luttrell with Lone Survivor and Chris, Chris and I, we had our book come out within a month of each other, American Sniper and the Red Circle. We were all very supportive, but we were the first guys and we took a lot of crap from the community. And some guys that were some of the most vocal guys about us writing books now have books of their own and, and big podcasts. Of course, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> you blaze the trail. Yeah. And it's it's like, you know, I think you're always gonna trailblazers are always gonna take the the kind of early early hits. Um yeah, I, I mean it's it, it just comes with the territory. I mean it and um it is what it is. I I, I think writing for me has been really therapeutic. I, I've lost a lot of friends in the war um writing about it i wrote a book called among heroes donated a bunch of money um to to military charities with that book um it's just therapeutic man that's and, a good way to honor those guys too yeah and, and people get to know them and know the families and yeah i mean just from my research it's um it's been really cool just getting kind of getting the humanitarian the you know the humane side of it and the the impact of like, you know, what happens when someone goes to war, doesn't come back. And, but so what, what made you decide to become a SEAL in the first place? Um, so I, as long as I can remember back to my Robotech cartoon watching days, <laughs> um, I want to be a pilot. 
um, you know, I, you saw my Instagram, I, fl I fly today pretty uh, regularly, but sometimes, you know, life nudges us in certain directions. I, I had my parents moved from Canada to the US, had a dream to sail around the world on a sailboat, uh, my family, my sister, myself, uh, mom, dad, and, and our dog lived on a sailboat for five years, did a lot of sailing through Mexico, on and off homeschooled. We were, when we were living on the boat in California, uh, my mom came home one day and said, hey, there's this scuba diving boat that's looking for a young kid uh, to, to kind of work for tips. And they, the captain said he would train you how to scuba dive. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. So I got this incredible job. Um, it was the second real job I had. At first job was sweeping up a boat store, which was just <laughs> it was horrible. Like Sounds mopping, like it smells bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mopping the floor, sweeping, just like thankless, low pay. But those kind of jobs build character, I think. For uh, sure. And then I got this amazing job opportunity. And so I started working and I would like take the boat, had a private chef. We had a hot tub on the boat. We would take sport divers out to dive you know, these incredible islands off the coast of California called the Channel Islands. And I grew up in uh, Huntington Beach, so. Not yeah, so you gotta, those, those are just north of Santa Barbara, right? Or, or off the coast of Santa Barbara, I think. Right? The coast of Santa Barbara, kind yeah. of from like Oxnard to Santa Barbara, and then a few south of that, uh, San Nicolas Island, Santa Barbara Island, and then Catalina, which you, you've seen off the coast. Um, but incredible job. Like I, I learned how to scuba dive, um, I was making really good money as a third, by the time I was 13, I was, you know, probably making a hundred bucks a trip and I was trading my, you couldn't sell your lobster or abalone, but you could kind of do these backdoor trades. So I, I would like trade the sushi bar. I had like $500 in food credit cause I'd give them lobster and abalone. So take my family out to dinner it was a great job. And then I started making real money when I was 15, I was getting paid a, a deckhand wage and um, you know, I, and I would work summers and weekends on the boat um, overcame a lot of my fears. I, I remember, um, sorry, this is going to be a long answer to your, to your seal. Oh, that's great. Go for it. This is laying the groundwork. Um, I remember getting woke up at two in the morning at San Miguel Island, which is the furthest, north of the channel islands near point conception off the coast of santa barbara and we were there because it's a beautiful island it, it's very hard to get to because the weather is so rough um, but when you can get there the underwater scenery is like going back 50 years in time it's just the the species and the population is are incredible it's also a big sea seal and sea lion habitat which great white sharks feed on. So um, <laughs> we were out there and this crazy captain, Mike, who actually like did a whole trip to hunt a great white shark in spirit. He's a crazy, crazy fucking guy. So Mike wakes, <laughs> Mike wakes me up at like two in the morning at Sam, Sam Miguel Island. He's like, Hey Webb, go get your wetsuit on. You got to dive and get the anchor unstuck. Cause the, the weather had gotten rough. We had to move the boat to calmer water in the middle of the night. And I was just like, thinking to myself like that's crazy like I i've done that in the daylight before because the chain would get wrapped around a big reef structure and you know i dive down and that's fine in the daylight when we're not in like shark infested waters i was just like thinking about it I'm like this is crazy and i'm like coming out of rem sleep i'm cold you know now i gotta go put a wetsuit on and dive 50 feet down and, and what i know is going to be shitty visibility like you can see this far uh, but i'm like okay, I guess I got to just, what I got to, what am I going to do? Like, I don't want to let these guys down. So I just had to like swallow my fear and, and do it. Um, but stuff like that, where you, you end up doing it and realizing, okay, that wasn't that bad. Yeah. Um, at an early age was, was a real benefit. Oh, you were 15 when you did that. I, I wasn't even 15. This was wow. like, this was like my first season on the boat. When I was 13. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm terrified to scuba dive by the way. So I have like insane respect for seals. Yeah. Cause like, that's like my, like the ocean is my biggest fear admittedly. Yeah. And um, you know, just any of that shit just scares me to death, but <laughs> that's amazing. I, re I remember this dive. Like, 
I'm like, I have a big flashlight and I'm going down the anchor chain, holding on a chain. And I'm seeing these like phos bioluminescent flashes go by me. It's the seals. Like they're everywhere. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, I was like, okay, good. They're, they're here. That's good. There's no sharks around. Cause when they right. vanish, you know, there's a big great white in the water. Um, but it was just brutal, man. Um, getting down and seeing this massive ledge, like the size of a automobile and just like, it was rocking up and down with the chain and the boat. Um, yeah. How do you even get that unstuck? I mean, I guess you, you basically signal, you blow a bunch of bubbles to the surface uh -huh. and they pay out slack and you swim it around and then you blow another set, which means they can start pulling it in and then you watch and make sure the anchor goes and then you can surface. But um, yeah, that, that was all like pre Navy seal training for me. So I, I ended up, working that boat all through high, high school. My parents took this big trip to on our sailboat to New Zealand. I didn't want to go. I had this great job and, and good make making good money as a teenager. Um, but I left on this trip when I was 15, about to turn 16. Um, went from Acapulco to the Marquesas Islands. Then the next uh, chain was the French Tuamotos and then Tahiti, which is the Society Islands. And my dad and I had this massive argument over, over seamanship. And he was like, I think you should leave. And so I left home at 16, uh, grabbed a backpack, a couple hundred bucks and found a boat sailing to Hawaii. Uh, and then called oh, my he, he didn't want you to, to be a seaman or he, no, we got in, we were just arguing. It was like teenage, typical, like father, teenage son bullshit. Right. I had a big chip on my shoulder um, I was a smart ass and I would say, look, why, why are we doing this? We should do it this way. Mm -hmm. My mom said it was like having two captains on the boat and, and she's like, in most cases you were right. And then it would, you would end up being right. And it would drive your dad nuts. So, um, you know, the lesson that I reflect back on in life is, you know, for one, I have a ton of respect for my parents who put us on a sailboat, sailed halfway around the world before we had fucking GPS. Like we were taking yeah. star and sun sights with a sextant. Wow. We had sat nav. Luckily every 12 hours, if you caught the satellite, you would get a position fix. So like, you know, my dad had some major stones to take the family and do that kind of thing. But when I think back, I'm like, this is um, a lesson in leadership. Like you really have to understand sometimes, even though, you may know best you need to know your role and i wasn't the captain you know my dad had a ton of responsibilities outside of like choosing where to anchor and what what kind of sail to use on a given day there can be one captain right having two captains you know one person has to lead mm -hmm. sometimes good leaders have to be good followers and i wasn't a good follower my my dad fucking kicked me off the boat because of it we got in a big argument and he's like, I think, I think it's time for you to leave home. <laughs> and he got, you know, kicked out when, when he was 16 for not growing, for not cutting his hair in Canada. My, my grandfather was a strict kind of Irish Canadian. Mm -hmm. and he was like, cut your, cut your fucking hair or get out. And my dad left and moved to Malibu. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> so, um, I when your son's 16, you have, you have a son or you have daughters? Yeah, no, I have kids. And okay. Well, when they're 16, you know what you can do. <laughs> I'll never kick them. Um, but um, the point is, um, to, answer your, to answer your question, make a, a long story longer. I came back <laughs> to California. The owner, Bill, of the boat let me work on the boat. I had, one, I had a little less than a year of high school to finish. I finished it and I'm like, what the hell am I going to do with myself? I, I, I don't have the grades to go to, to any of the Naval Academies or, or to get into one of the, the uh, officer training programs at one of the universities. Uh, so I started looking at the Navy and then I read a book on the Navy SEALs called Rogue Warrior, written by the founder of SEAL Team 6, Dick Marcinko. And I said, I can do this. Like, and it's a challenge. It's, like a, it's a challenge to myself and I, I wanted to challenge myself. And so I, I started doing research and ended up joining the, the Navy 
uh, after high school and I had a pretty, I had a pretty great run. I, the Navy paid for my college. Um, I had an amazing time in the, in the military. Um, you know, I went to combat in Afghanistan. I, I saw enough to, to kind of like feel, you know, cause look, I would be lying if I said that you don't want to test yourself, right? Like you don't want to do all this training and then never deploy into an operational environment. But I had did that in Afghanistan. I said, like, you know what I did? I, I did probably 20 plus combat missions and, and could, could, you know, sleep well at night knowing that I had what it takes. I, I didn't, you know, and, and I'm telling you, I, I've seen a few SEALs that were, um, when it came down to it, that moment of truth that couldn't do it, like, or, or were on that fence. And I'm like, oh man, I, I would have never thought I would, would see that day. But I, the point is, you know, I could get off that ramp, helicopter ramp in the middle of the night and go do, go do a, my job and know that, you know, I, I got the job done and, and kind of tested myself in that combat environment. And, and it had nothing left to prove to anybody uh, including myself, which is the most important person. Yeah. Like there, there's not, not a lot of feelings in life that beat that, you know, where you're like, all right, I've done this thing that was really hard to do. Yeah. It took me a really long time. And you kind of know that you've accomplished that. Like you can, I mean, that, that's, that builds so much character and confidence. Um, yeah. It's, you know, or else I would always wonder. Right. And that's why a lot of guys that had left the SEAL teams before 9-11 came back in because they never got to test themselves in combat and answer that question. Do I have what it takes? And so, um, you know, and so I, you know, I, that's how I became a seal. I, I spent um, just under 10 years in the seal teams. Um, I came back from Afghanistan, got involved in, uh, in instructor duty um, as advanced sniper trainer. And then I got recruited uh, by a guy named Bob, who was a uh, SEAL Team 6 uh, senior chief, to uh, help uh, modernize the Navy SEAL sniper program. And at the time, we had two programs, East and West Coast, and we wanted to kind of consolidate the way we trained um, and also become better trainers, modernize the course with technology, but also like, how do we coach better? How do we be, be better instructors? So we, ha we had a unlimited resources and, and work with some of the top mental management professionals in the world in the Olympic arena and the professional sports world. Um, a great experience. Um, I invested a lot of time, uh, but I was having marriage issues and, and I kind of saw like we we're in Iraq now. And, and I started to kind of start paying attention to more like the geopolitical situation. And it's like, what are we doing? Like, we're like, what's the purpose behind Afghanistan? And I started asking these questions and seeing this like never ending war happen. And I'm like, okay, I need to go. Like, it's my time um, back to when I had that crappy job as a 12 year old sweeping up the boat store. When I got a job on the dive boat, I'm like, this doesn't seem like work. This is fun. And I, mm -hmm. and I'd learned that lesson early on. And I said, I made that promise to myself. I'm never going to do a job that I don't like doing. And the SEALs got to that point for me in 2006. I said, it's been great. I'm not having fun now. It's affecting my personal life. I want to be, you know, around, see my five-year-old son, you know, play baseball um, and sports and be there, be there for the fam. So I left in 2006 and people thought I was crazy. They, um, you know, and what I learned is when you're in the brotherhood, you're in the brotherhood. When you're out, you're out cold. Yeah. And guys were pissed off because I had just gotten, uh, I got early promoted uh, before I took the sniper job. Um, and then I got, I made chief because I was filling a, a, a billet. I, I was a sniper course manager as an E6 and it was an E8 uh, in rank. So two ranks higher job. So I made chief my first time up and guys were resentful. Like, oh, you just wasted this promotion. I'm like, no, I did not I fucking earned it. And now I'm getting out and going on to the next phase of my life. Um, and so I left in 2006, got into entrepreneurship and just really, you know, had a, had a bunch of failures, had some success, more, thankfully more, more success than failure. Um, learned from it and, and drove on. I, I started getting into writing after I lost my first startup. 
in uh, the housing crisis of 2008. Um, got a book deal that got me into writing, blogging, media. And, you know, today I, I run a, a digital media business. Um, I write on the side. I just wrote my first novel, which I, I sold to Random House this summer. Um, I've had a great pandemic. Um, I'm not going to lie. I, I made a decision early on when the, you know, the world started going to hell. I said, you know, I, I'm going to use this time to, to really, uh, because I know, I know the way people think they get down. They, they, yeah, actually one of my questions was like, what is it, what is going through this pandemic like as a, you know, a Navy SEAL or someone who's, who's seen crazy shit? Um, I've had a great pandemic, by the way, for me, it's been a total blessing in disguise not to, you know, for a lot of people watching, you know, might be, you know, thinking like, oh, this is horrible. But, you know, these opportunities of despair can be the best opportunities of growth. Yeah. I know, having been through SEAL training and, and watch 90% of my classmates quit mm -hmm. um, or fail out because of the because of their mindset. Um, knowing how a lot of people, and it's unfortunate that a lot of it has to do with the environments we grew up in and, and, the, and the cultural social pressures where they kind of condition a lot of people if they don't have good parents or, or good environments to, to just kind of like accept it and, and be like, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to spend 2020 watching fucking Netflix and feeling sorry for myself. Um, I, I knew that the bulk of the people would be in that headspace. And I'm like, I'm going to take some territory. I sold a business that was struggling. It grew like we had grown. Uh, I had grown a subscription box business called Crate Club. It grew way too fast, out of control, zero to 15 million revenue in a couple of years. Um, and then COVID hit our supply chain, just disrupted the whole thing, sold to a competitor. I'm like, okay, it's not the as big of an exit as I hoped for, but it was a, a good one. I needed to sell it, sold that. Um, then I was like, okay, how do I go on offense? My old CMO, uh, Alda, her and I were talking about health and wellness and that there's an opportunity in, in the kids space. We co-founded a kid's vitamin business called Tiger Gummies together, raised money for that, invested in it, launched it. She's running it today. Um, looked at my core media business and said, okay, time to kind of get that back in shape. Started really looking at producing better content, uh, getting rid of some people that needed to go um, that weren't on, on board. You know, it, it's, uh, you know, I started focusing on a business like, okay, these guys clearly aren't on board with like where, where we want to go. Um, I finished my novel, which I've been working on for a couple of years, sold it to Random House, the biggest advance I ever got immediately ended up in a bidding war with like the top streaming networks to turn that book into a TV series. Just sold that this week. Um, nice. Congrats. That's the one about the, the serial killer on the, uh, aircraft. Oh, yeah. I sold it to, we sold it to Peacock. Um, Oh, nice. And, and now I'm, I'm like investing in real estate. I had bought a self storage investment business that's doing well. I've um, heard those are really good investments by the way. Yeah, yeah. Because no, <laughs> everyone, no one ever takes their shit out, and they pay forever. And, yeah. and you could raise the rent 10, 10 15 percent, and you're not going to take your crap out of storage. And if you're paying eighty bucks or hundred bucks a month to store something, is an eight dollar rent increase really going right. to? But I, that's one of the, the biggest things I, I tell to to guys who come in my program. Like, if you have shit in storage, burn it. You know, just donate it. Like, it's the biggest because you'll never use that shit. But Sorry, tangent. Anyways, go on. <laughs> no. In most cases, I will say I gave up my New York City apartment and have a lot of expensive furniture um, in self-storage in Hoboken, New Jersey. So okay. <laughs> generally, I would advocate, yeah, it's mostly crap, but there are the circumstances where uh, you've got expensive stuff with nowhere to put it. Totally. Um, but the point is, I, I just decided to have a good pandemic and, and I've had one. And I remember having calls this summer, even with my editor and we were checking in she's like, Oh my God, it's so nice just to hear you talk about year 2020. Cause I've been in this like conversations in the workplace with people that are just down and depressed and lost the job. And look, I have friends in the food and food and beverage industry. And I, I think that's one of the ones that got hit the worst. 
um, a good a friend that I had met who managed one of my favorite restaurants. She started messaging me like, what do I do? And I could just tell him like, oh, wow, she's in a really bad, bad headspace. And I was even giving her like she was asking for advice because I'm not a big fan of sharing advice unsolicited. I, I think it's yeah. abusive. It's annoying <laughs> for sure. Yeah. She was asking for it and I was giving her all this advice, like how to start a business, how to change career just right over the head. Cause she, I was like, okay, she's just not in a place where she wants to listen. She, she more, I think wanted me to just be miserable and be like, Oh, that's terrible. And yeah, that sucks. And it's like, no, I'm just not that way. Like it's, I mean, what a fucking time to live in to reinvent yourself, make a career change, start a business, buy a business. There's so many businesses for sale in America that are cash flowing where the owner just wants to retire. I looked at a wine business in the city, the, the owner's late seventies just wants to like hand it off to somebody mm -hmm. finance it. And it, and it, it nets like 300 K a year. Like you can, yeah. you're in a pretty fucking good living off 300 K a year net. And this guy, so these opportunities are, are out there. It's just, you know, you got to be in the right headspace to, to kind of look at things. Yeah. I mean, there's so many people that friends of mine, people, they, they spend all their time watching the news, watching the worldometer of how many cases, how many, this. I'm like, why would you waste your time on that? Like I got Corona back in June. Um, uh, you know, I lost taste and smell for about 10 days. Um, met my girlfriend the first day I had it. She heard I had Corona and she was like, I'm not scared of Corona. She came over. We shared a fucking shisha together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, and not, not to say like, you know, I also had a friend's dad who died from it, you know, but he was older who had complications, but. Probably would have died from the flu too. If you exactly. He was already in the hospital. Um, but to live your life as if, this, you know, this disease being a young person is going to, you know, radically change. It's just such a bad, it's such a bad math decision. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, it's sad. And as a living in America and it's somebody that loves New York city as much as I do to see the, the fear-based decision-making and the just re, you know, for, I'm not going to be politically correct here, but the retarded decisions that de Blasio has made around, oh, we can keep Saks Fifth Avenue open, uh, but we can't, we can't dine indoors. Like, dude, I'm looking at snow covered <laughs> streets and, and like minus three degrees Celsius outside right now, nobody's dining outdoors. Like it's right. miserable. They can't, it's in the delivery guys. It's hard for them to deliver in the snow and you're just taking away you know, you're, you've jerked around the restaurant industry for the entire year where it's like, oh, you can go back to indoor with limited amount. They hire people back. Then you change the rules two weeks later. My friend got fined $8,000 by the city of New York because he was feeding his staff who had just finished working side by side in the kitchen before they went home. And, and the city official said, oh, nobody can dine inside. He's like, they've been working side by side to like cook in the kitchen they're my staff. No, I'm sorry. Here's a $8,000 ticket. So that's like the government's thank you to the, to the heart and soul of New York, which is food so fucked up. Um, among the entertainment stuff. But yeah, just watching these, you know, government officials make these terrible decisions that, and I, I think in another life, I would love to be an economist, but I'm, it's all about incentives. And, and then people are like, fuck it. I'm, I'm going to move to Miami or Texas or, or overseas. Yeah. Like, I was yeah. looking at, yeah, I mean, I love Kia, but I was looking at apartments in Barcelona mm -hmm. um, because yeah, you can go. I mean, I think the one great thing about the pandemic is it's really shown how people can work remotely and work from home and be very productive. And that genie is out of the bottle and not going fucking back inside. Yeah. No one, no one's going to want to go back to an office that didn't. No like, one's. Yeah. yeah not there's just no reason for it. Plus it's, I think people now know it's, you know, you've got, I don't know how many millions of square feet of commercial real estate in New York. And they're like, what the hell do we do with this? Like no one's bringing back three, 400 people and packing them into office. Yeah. 
yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. So, but I mean, having that attitude is, is key. I wanted to, I wanted to circle back and ask you a bit more about, so when you were in, you know, throughout your, your service, um, you were married at that point. When did you divorce? I got married when I was 23. Um, it was really the first, I think the first woman I had truly fallen in love with. And, you know, I think we can fall, you know, we're biological creatures, right? We, we get those, those, uh, hormones going and, and, uh, you know, we can fall in love with multiple people. I think that just happens, but it's the, like a very first time I'd really fallen hard for somebody. And, you know, she was 19 finishing university. Um, and, you know, when you're young, you don't think about the future, right? You don't think about, okay. I mean, this is an important thing I've, I've been talking about recently because I, one thing I did get into, my son got me back into, he's on the chess team at school before Queen's Gambit was like a popular thing. I got, he got me back into chess and um, I started getting coached. I, just got into chess. I started getting coached by a grandmaster and uh, she was analyzing my games. And it's like, Brandon, you're very good tactically. Um, and I hated to hear this because I, in business, I'm all about strategy, but she's like, you're playing the game with no strategy. And I'm like, holy shit, she's so right. So I, you know, and so I feel like um, that's such an important life lesson, um, you know, to think about the end game, right? But uh, mm -hmm. it, it just not enough people think about, okay, what do I want out of my, out of my life? And so when I'm, a, you know, when you're young and in love, you don't think about, okay, what, what's the future you should think about together if you're with somebody what's the future look like what do we want do we have a shared vision of the future or um, in my case um, as we got older she's like I don't want to travel that much I love to travel I grew up freaking sailing around the world on my parents boat oh, yeah <laughs> I had she was a very private person I'm a very outgoing person she, when I left the Navy, I was getting into entrepreneurship and just like sank our, most of our life savings in my first <laughs> venture, right? She's like, I don't want to be married to an entrepreneur. So you realize <laughs> that stuff later in life when you should, you know, you should think about this. If, if you're in a relationship considering getting married young, are we on the same path? And, and things change, life changes. But if you have these fundamental differences they're going to get to a point where you're going to reach a why in the road and somebody has to really make a hard compromise or the relationship ends. And, and that's what happened for us. We just decided we were, um, we wanted different things in life. She wanted more stability um, and, and not didn't want the same lifestyle. And thankfully we, we broke up in, in uh, therapy. We had a really good clinical psychologist working with us and, and we had, we had young kids and she coached us on how to talk to the kids about it. Um, make sure we put our differences aside and focused on the kids. Um, she told me privately as the therapist, um, she said, look, I'm going to tell you this, it's going to be tough, but you know, make sure that uh, your ex is happy because happy, happy mom equals happy kids. And so mm -hmm even like tough decisions that I had to make were, you know, just because of the loss that I was right and I could do certain things and not, not let her move two counties away. I thought about them. Okay. This is, I'm investing in her happiness because I know that that's going to translate to happiness in my kids. And, you know, right now I, my oldest son um, who was born when I was in Afghanistan is, is a math major at university of St. Andrews. He's like number tied for number one on the chess team. He is working on a first AI startup because he's big into machine learning. He runs our self storage business and crushed it for us. Um, wow. and my daughter is 16, just finished spending a weekend in New York with me because uh, she got hired by Saks Fifth Avenue and Puma to be an in-store artist. Like my kids are great. They're independent and yeah. you know, yeah. So mom and dad are divorced doesn't matter like um, yeah. 
And I feel like that's probably my next nonfiction book is about relationships because most of them, I think in America and elsewhere, the marriages end in divorce. And if you have children involved, a lot of times these parents weaponize their kids um, yeah. and you're really just fucking yourself for the future. Cause if you have, you know, I don't know many parents that don't love their kids and want their kids to do well, but when you weaponize them and, and trash talk your ex, you're poisoning your kids and then they're going to end up with problems. And then you're, you're stuck dealing with like, and it's yeah. like the problem of, okay, Hunter, where are you going to do your first semester um, at St. Andrews? If you can't go to campus, you end up with, okay, where am I going to send this kid to rehab or, you know, this yes. kind of, you know, it's just, you know, so I, I think that. Yeah. That's so important because you, you hear so many stories of, you know, going through divorces, dealing with attorneys, it really gets people at odds and you stop, you know, it's like you want to, you're, you're fighting this fight against your ex. Yeah. You're trying to make their life worse versus what you're talking about, which is make their life better. It's just going to be better for you. Yeah. Better for everybody in the long run, but it, we're emotion, humans are emotional beings and it yeah. takes a lot sometimes to kind of stuff that what you really want to, you know, burst out in, in the moment and just put it aside. It, and it's as a single guy, I, I, I don't have a problem dating women with kids. My pro with the exception, which is a big exception is when I was first divorced and, and, and was, had been on many dates with different women with children, I would say 9.5 out of 10 had terrible relationship with the ex and I could see it happening. I'm like, I don't want to fucking be part of this. I don't want to deal with, throw myself and my own kids into the, into the middle of this like toxic relationship. So I just don't date women with kids generally because of that rule. And um, that's, that's a whole nother whole <laughs> single, single life's a whole nother story. But, but as far as that goes, I don't do it for that reason. It's not, you know, it's just generally most people don't have good relationships with their exes and, and, and it's toxic. They're fighting families are fighting kids, kids are upset. Um, and I don't want to be part of that. And, um, that's why I'm like, man, I should write a book about this. Cause, um, I have a great relationship with my ex. She remarried, had two more kids. I I've like cooked, cooked dinner for her and her husband and the whole family before. Yeah, you absolutely should. Cause you know, I'm in the relationship space and you just don't see that sort of stuff. Yeah. And There's not enough resources for, and, and sure. And a lot of these like relationship books are written by single psychologists mm -hmm. that don't have kids. And uh, <laughs> the fuck you know, you know, like I get you've been educated, but um, I feel like that's, yeah, I would have something to contribute there. And so maybe that'll be my next project. Yeah, no, I, I think you definitely should. Cause just the way you spoke about it now, it's um, very radically different from the mainstream sort of narrative out there. Yeah. So curious. So in the SEAL program, what, what's the percentage of single guys to guys like married? Because it seems like just as a civilian, you know, when you just look at the media or whatever, it seems like more guys than not um, would have like a, you know, military bride or whatever. Maybe they just portray that in the movies. I mean, look, this is a lesson in incentives. Mm -hmm. And I think if I'm in charge of the Department of Defense, this would be the, one of the first things I would do is on your enlistment contract or whether you're officer enlisted, you sign an agreement, you will not be married for, for your term, your first term in the military. Because what happens is, let's say you're some 18 year old kid from Alabama, you're like out of the freaking country for the first time in your life. Um, you join the Navy, you get stationed on a ship and you're living in this like fucking cubicle on, on board a ship. And then you see your buddy who just got married, married his college or high school sweetheart. He gets to move off the ship because he gets a housing stipend and gets paid mm -hmm. extra. And this kid is like, wait a minute, I can go get married and like move off this, this crappy ship and get paid more money. So that's what happens. It creates this financial mm -hmm. incentive for people to get married. And then that creates a bigger issue, like cultural issue where, it's like, oh yeah, you should get married. So everyone's like encouraging other. And that's why you see a lot of young military marriages because th there's this like financial carrot hanging sure, in front. That's of a huge carrot. 
I mean, that's ridiculous. Massive care. I know a guy that married a lesbian student at San Diego State. She got free medical, great medical coverage. Um, and he got all the extra money and got to live off base. Like that happens all the time. So I would just like take away that incentive because that that is a big contribution to to kind of like the culture of it's okay to be married so young in the military. And the, the aftermath of divorce and drama that comes from that incentive is just, it's a fucking disaster, man. So um, to your point in the SEALs, I would say when I was at SEAL Team 3, half, maybe I want to say like half, just like quickly gut checking it of the mm-hmm. guys who are married. But a lot of it's like being on a professional sports team. You're traveling all over the world. And I know, I know I have really close friends that play professional sports. I would say most of them cheat on their, their wives because they're out there traveling and they get hit on. Yeah. Um, you got a few, few drinks in them and it's like, you got some, you know, women throwing, throwing themselves at you. Um, there's only so much we can do. Sure. <laughs> right. So, a lot of males. Um, you know, that's just, happens a lot and you get a lot of a lot of marriages um that end in and in divorce unfortunately and and i'm in this i have a really good friend um that i went to harvard business school with who's my age lives in zurich and he's like my relationship guru almost i mean he's got two girlfriends they know about each other they know that he's never going to settle down and have kids um and he's like you just need to start being honest with women about what you want and you'll start attracting the right women to your lifestyle. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out like, do I want companionship? Um, I do like the idea of having long-term companionship, you know, and I, I do see, um, I do know people that have great relationships. Um, they have a good sex life. They get along. A lot of the ones that I see work, it's because they, the the couple and they have something that they do together even like business related it works yeah um and that kind of keeps them engaged but it's fucking tough man like i'm just finishing that book sapiens right now and you know i generally would say we're not wired to be monogamous um, yeah as men especially and and that's where i think it gets really it gets tough I, I do think that's why men take, you know, we call it, they, they mature later. I, I think generally men are older um, in that kind of zone. I am probably in, in, in their, you know, forties and you start thinking about, okay, maybe it's time for me to, to settle down because the idea of like companionship in, into kind of old age sounds, sounds great, but I'm trying hey. to, right now man <laughs> have you read uh sex of dawn heard of that one you know what i have that book in storage i haven't read it yet it's yeah no very it's, good it tackles a lot of this it gets it gets into the science of how men are wired are we monogamous um and it's uh you know for me i'm 38 and i don't have any kids um and that's a totally different discussion for someone like you you've got you know almost grown kids um, kids are amazing, man. I can tell you this. It because I have a lot of single friends. The same, mm-hmm. thing, right? It, like single, no kids. It, it is an incredibly rewarding experience having kids. Like I wouldn't. I, I'm really glad that I I have had kids. But anyway, you were you were gonna say? No, it just becomes a totally because I have a lot of friends who like I'm friends with just some of the most ridiculous, you know, playboys around. Um, you know, living in Kiev, um, just the shit I'm exposed to on a regular basis. But most of these guys, they get into their their late 30s. and like, all right, I don't have kids. I'm going to find the nearest Playboy model with the best DNA to impregnate and then have the kid. Then they go back to like the, it's very hard for guys to leave that sort of insane, single, you know, fun mentality. Um, but but it's really interesting from my standpoint because all the guys I know who have kids who you know have kids are a little bit older they've raised their kids they're 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 so happy that they did have kids and whether or not that relationship worked or not um 
it, it, I don't know. It's just a different. So I ask myself like, cause I also want to have kids. Um, yeah. I, I that do. monogamy question is, is always interesting to, to ask people. Cause I, I've, yeah. I do think we're at a place in time and history where we don't have the, the same social constructs of religious limitations and stuff like that. I, I feel like if you wanted to have a kid, you could probably find a beautiful, smart woman in Ukraine and say, look, this, you know, let's have a baby together, but I'm, you know, it's, it's not going to come potentially with this traditional, um, idea of marriage I, I do know like there are plenty of women i know that are in their they're in that kind of baby zone right the the late 20s to mid 30s where they really want to have a baby themselves and um i just had an ex-girlfriend actually um who i'm still friends with beautiful russian girl in new york and she she's having a kid on her own and she's like couldn't be happier she's like really wanted wanted to have a, a child. So I feel like there are those situations out there where you can have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. Yeah. And just be like, Hey, let's all, you know, I'm going to be here to support, you know, and be part of this unit, but you don't have to, you don't deal with the same social bullshit that we would have to deal with in the fifties and sixties, right? Where totally you're looked down upon. <laughs> yeah. The world and is, what you said before about um, just being able to be honest from the get go. It's, yeah. you know, when, when you just kind of put it out there, um, you'll find so many women that are down for that, that are looking for that. Um, yeah. Whereas traditionally, like you're saying in the 50s, like that mentality is a bit new to think like, Oh, there are people out there who are looking for that, who want some sort of open sort of, you know, open marriage, open relationship, or just have kids be good parents together. But have extracurricular activities on the side, all that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so um, two other random questions I want to ask you. One, uh, if you if you had to go as a, a random person, who's more dangerous, a SEAL or like a trained MMA fighter? I think a SEAL. Really? Yeah. I, look, I have a lot of respect for the guys that do MMA. Um, the thing about the difference between MMA – and in, in doing like even jujitsu and and uh and the seal teams and I, i'll tell you a quick funny story so i wrestled in school um i was a pretty good wrestler um uh, you know i placed second in, in um regionals and went on to i should have placed third but i placed fifth in state um so i wrestled and i you know i find myself in the seal teams and i mean i remember it being at this party that my sister, my sister went to the same, she went to San Diego state, um, same town, right. She's going to school. Um, at the same time, um, my ex was going to school that my, the, the girl I ended up marrying. Um, but my sister threw this big party and there's this guy, big guy who's acting like a jerk. And so I asked him to leave. He, he didn't want to leave. And I, I kind of, you know, grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and marched him outside. And, and I think it was, it was so we have a thing in the saying in the SEAL team, violence of action. It's just like, I, like no one, I don't think any, this is the first time in this guy's life. Cause he's a big guy. This guy's like probably had at least six inches on me and, and at 30, 40 pounds. I just like grabbed him and freaking marched him out. And he was, it happened so fast. And he was so shocked that he like came back to the door and was like banging for an hour with this guy. And he was drunk too. He right. just was, he was so embarrassed and shocked that he just got manhandled and he wanted to fight me. Right. And my, I remember my friend Jason was there. He's like, Hey dude, just go like kick this guy's ass and get it over with. Right. And I'm like, I was like, I really don't want to, I'm like enjoying myself. So out I go. And this guy is like a football player for the, I guess for the university. And it's like this big crowd, like everyone, like he's riled up all his fraternity brothers. And I'm like, really guys, are we really going to do this? And it's like this crowd of people in the driveway. And this guy takes a swing at me and I put him in a, I basically sidestep it. I wrap him up and I take him down and he's, he's basically on the ground and I'm like putting him in this like chokehold and he tries to tap out. 
And I think to myself, like, like, dude, no fucking way are you tapping out of this no rep here, man. Sorry. Yeah, you've got like, you got me into this shit now. Not a chance you're tapping out. And I, so I said, and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, how do I deal with this? So I said, you need to tell, and there's this crowd around, right? I was like, you need to scream. I was like, you need to tell. I, I, I remember whispering in his ear, like, you need to say that you give up. Like, I give up as loud as you can. <laughs> so he screams it. Uh, he screams it again. Like I told him, I'm like fucking louder. Because yeah. I was choking the life out of this guy. Right. And, and, um, and so I, I put him to sleep anyway. I made him scream and I put him to sleep and I laid him there. And I was like, you need to check on your, your buddy make sure he's okay. He was like laying flat on the driveway. And his friend was like, hey, man, it's cool. Like, because it was like he had some, he found out it was a seal and he wanted to like, you know, man up or whatever the fuck it was. But I was right. like, you guys need to get the fuck out of here. You're next. Right. And so all his friends like drug him out and left. Um, but that's the difference. There's a certain tenacity and life or death that comes. And I don't like fighting because look, if, if it comes to that point, I'm going to fucking gouge your eye out, man. Like I'm going to bite your fucking ear off Mike Tyson style. I'm going to freaking gouge your eyeball out, pressure point you. I'm going to get some type of advantage and fucking hurt you very badly. Cause I'm in a totally different mindset than you are in the octagon going to tap some, try and get somebody to tap out. It's just, it's different between life and death and, and, and that mindset. And I've, and it's it, why I don't like fighting is because I've, people generally think, Oh, Brandon, like, how could you be a Navy SEAL? You're so nice. And, but when that switch goes off, man, it's on. And I've had people like, Whoa, like I've never seen that come out in you. And I don't want to go to that place. Cause I know like when you're there, it's like, we're going to finish this and it's not going to end up with you tapping out. And then that's the difference between somebody that has trained in the special forces and, and have been in those life and death situations where you're going into a room and you don't know if that guy behind the door has a fucking knife, an ax, a fucking gun pointed at you, a gun pointed at someone's head. And you're going in there to fucking get the job done no matter what. And, and that's the difference between the, the mindset and, and it's mindset, like, yeah comes down to like, are you, are you willing, you know, because MMA is a sport obviously yeah. versus this is real yeah. life. It's a combat. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And it, now, now the guys that like Tim Kennedy who are special forces and an MMA guy. Yeah. Don't fuck with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the difference. Cause I've, I've seen it, man. I've seen it. And it's a different, it's like the guy at the bar, like shoving. It's like, dude, I'm not shoving you. The first thing that's going to happen, I'm going to smash this fucking glass in your nose. And, Cause I know your fucking eyes are going to water and then you can't see, and you're going to have blood all over your face because the broken glass. And now I'm at a total advantage. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's like, I'm not like, if we're going to go there, like we're going to go there really fast <laughs> and right. I'm going to end it as fast as possible as dirty and, any cheating advantage I can get, I will use, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. <laughs> well, that answers that question. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> totally. Uh, no doubts in my mind. I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure what you would say, but that was a, a very convincing answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next for you at this point, man? Um, I went, I got hired to give a talk this summer to a mastermind group. And I looked, this guy was amazing. I'm like, shit, why don't I have something like this? Cause people are always asking me. Um, cause, and I was also thinking about what do I do? Um, what do I do next? Cause I built the crate club off of soft rep audience to, to a pretty big business and then sold it. And it's like, what next? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I naturally just, just fits well with, with my writing. I thought, you know, visiting this group in the summer, this guy's like making a couple million bucks a year with this very small team um, yeah. rushing it. And I was like, and he, he's a nice guy, but I'm like, there's, there's not a, a whole lot there. A lot of these guys, even like Ty Lopez, right. They're just kind of like fake it till you make it. Um, I, I've been there, done that, man. Like I've taught the fucking sniper program and I'm heavy into mental management um, I know it really well and I've 
used it myself. Um, and I just thought, okay, now more than ever with COVID it's, I'm like, okay, let's, let's do something like this, uh, for software app. And so the idea is it's around mental management mm -hmm. and getting a mental edge and we're going to start selling in January. That, that sounds amazing. I, um, I checked out some of your videos on Instagram, um, dropped a comment about the golf one. I'm not sure if you knew if it was me or not. Yeah. No, it was really good content. And I have a mastermind group um, and it's an amazing business model. Because yeah. you know, That's actually how you make money. This is probably not Airbnb only. <laughs> no, Airbnb is like the side hustle. Um, yeah. This podcast is basically like the, uh, just a marketing channel um, to my site where I offer the mastermind group. It's a monthly mastermind group. Guys pay 500 bucks a month. So it's pretty high ticket. It's, you know, it's a lot of the stuff that you talk about overcoming fear, you know, hitting on girls, building yeah. relationships, um, you know, growing your passive income, you know, a way for guys to single guys to work on improving themselves. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I think it's the best sort of business you can run because you can be anywhere, you know, and you're just yeah. talking to people that, you know, people in the, in the, those groups are like your buddies or, you know, they become friends very fast. So, you know, you don't even really feel like you're working most yeah. of the time. Dude, it's been uh, it's been awesome. It's been a pleasure to to hear all the stories and stuff. Like, for, so for people listening, where can they find out more about you? Or uh, uh, I mean, I'm on Instagram at Brandon T Webb. My website is just my full name, BrandonTylerWebb.com. That's that's my author page, um, and I'm act, I'm active on Instagram, so you know people can reach out there. And uh, yeah, it's been fun. Thanks for listening. If you want more, go to innerconfidence.com and don't forget to subscribe to this podcast for the latest episodes.